and uh, I don't even know who's singing. I haven't looked yet, so uh, we'll just go ahead and do that. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Deuteronomy with me tonight, please. You remember the word Deuteronomy? It's the second giving, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomos, the second giving of the law. Deuteronomy 32, verse 22. Deuteronomy 32:22. The divine text says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. And now Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Revelation chapter number 20, verse 14. The scripture says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, what I just read to you is the first mention and the last mention of hell in the Bible. It's mentioned 54 times, 54 verses, have the word H-E-L-L. Now, there are other references to hell that don't use the word hell, but uh, pit and so forth. But the word hell itself tonight is found 54 times in the Holy Bible. You can be seated. The Old Testament saint had a concept of hell, and you need to understand that to them it was the unseen state of the dead. That's what the word Sheol means. And the reason for that is because the saved and the lost both went to Sheol in the Old Testament. But Sheol had a, had a division, it had a great gulf separating the side where Abraham's bosom was located and the side where the unsaved went to. But they were both in Sheol. The New Testament counter to Sheol is Hades. It is the unseen state of the dead. It's where the soul goes uh, upon separation from the body. Uh, when that golden cord, that silver cord rather, that silver cord is broken and death takes place. The soul and spirit leaves the body. And the Old Testament scripture, time and again, mentions hell. It mentions it in a fashion where you just read it in Deuteronomy 32. His anger will burn to the lowest grave. Does that make sense? That means nothing. His anger will burn to the lowest hell, a place of judgment. In Psalm chapter number 9, verse 17, it says in the Old Testament, the wicked shall be turned into the grave. Does that make sense? That means nothing. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell. That means something because it has a direct relationship with being wicked. And so it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 5 and verse 14, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself. It's obvious from this statement that hell, therefore, is is left up to the Almighty who created it, that he can adjust it to any size he pleases. Uh, it's hard for us as, as, as uh, finite beings, as temporal beings, to comprehend an infinite being and an almighty being. God is almighty, folks. And therefore, we need to understand that anything that relates to creation is subject to his sovereign will and his choice. Amos chapter number 9 and verse 2 says, Though they dig into hell. And when I read that, I thought, my goodness, that's what happened over there in Russia and Siberia when they dug that mine, they dug that pit, they dug that hole in the ground. And they went down and they got to a point to where they could hear screams coming up out of that pit. Now, you can dismiss that and say it means nothing, but it happened, folks. But when you come to the New Testament, and these, of course, I just selected a few passages. There are far more passages in the Old Testament that refer to hell, but I tried to use these uh, to give you a, as broad a spectrum as I possibly could as to what it's talking about in the Old Testament. But when you come to the New Testament, especially to the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Nobody that ever lived on the face of this earth preached more on hell than he did. And he defined it in terms that are unmistakable. There is no way that you can mistake what he means when he mentions hell. In Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 22, he said, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the counsel. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now there's no way that you can make that the grave. No way. Hell fire is literally talking about a place of burning. In Matthew chapter number 5 and verse 29, in the same context, he said this, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. There is no way that that can be mistaken as the grave. Well, I thought you buried the body. You bury the physical body. But the soul is shaped like the body. You have a soulish body. And that's what goes to hell. The Bible said, come and touch this tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. Luke chapter number 16. You see what I mean? The soulish body, and that's what was in hell. In the book of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, the Bible said, And fear not them which kill the body, the physical body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear them, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now there's only one that can do that. And that's plain, folks. I mean, how can you make something any plainer than that? There are those who teach that the Lord Jesus Christ condescended to the superstitions and uh, fears of his generation so that he might be able to preach to them, but that he personally did not believe any of what he was saying, that he was trying to make it in such a fashion to where they could understand it in their limited knowledge and their limited education. So he used figurative speech to get the message across. Uh, authority for that? You ever find a book? You ever find a manuscript? Or anything of that nature that would uh, support some uh, wild statement like that? Absolutely not. But what you do find is time and time and time again, when the Lord Jesus Christ preached, he quoted the Old Testament many times. He used parables. Luke 16 is not a parable. But he gave a message to the people and made it plain. I mean, nobody could ever speak any plainer than he did. This is plain talk. You can't mistake what he's saying in Matthew chapter number 10. There's no mistaking it. There's no mistaking it. Let me read it for you again. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's only one that can do that. A man can only kill your body. He cannot touch your soul and spirit. He doesn't have that power. He doesn't have that authority, but God does. God does. The parallel passage to that is found in Luke 12, chapter number 12. He said, I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. See that? A different perspective saying the same thing. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. He's dead, then he's cast into hell. There's no way you could make that the grave. No way in the world that you could possibly make that the grave. Is it a real place? Yes, it's a real place. I just posted something on the internet before I came to church tonight. If you, I don't know if you've, if you've ever seen the Lion of Judah, which is Temple Baptist Church's website. But on the bottom right-hand corner is a little square, and the bottom says salvation. If you click on that salvation link, it'll take you to the salvation page. It had Jack Chick's track in the center of it. This is your life. We've had four people saved off of that track. And hadn't been on there two weeks. We just had a woman from Russia saved off of that track. But... Uh, uh, Brother Valence sent me a link today to a video about uh, hell. And uh, I viewed it. It's 17 minutes long. And it'll stir you. It really, it's, it's one of those things that will really get your attention. 
So I posted it on the internet. It's on our webpage of salvation. But I warn you, I warn you, you might not want to let your little children, the little ones, watch it. What? Pardon? Yeah? You haven't seen it? Well, uh, don't let the real little ones watch it because they'll probably have nightmares. But I would suggest that you watch it because it may, it may rekindle your understanding about what this is all about to begin with. It's not about buildings. And it's not about preachers. It's not about movements. It's about lost souls. Christ went to the cross and suffered a horrible death, a horrible death to keep you out of hell. So uh, view it. 17 minutes long. You can watch it tonight when you get home. Just click on the video at the top. Uh, I would suggest this to you. I don't know how old your computer is. But that thing that you get on the Internet with is called a browser. Internet Explorer is Microsoft's browser. Chrome is Google's browser. Firefox has a browser. Opera has a browser. There may be some more that I'm not, that I'm not aware of. And then Apple has Safari. And uh, probably all of these browsers, if you'll update them and get the latest version, and they're free. You don't have to pay anything for it. They're free because they're competing with each other. And if you'll get the latest browser, uh, when you get on the Internet, you'll be able to see things that your old browser cannot see because of the improvements in web pages and what have you. I would suggest that you get the latest version of the Internet Explorer or Chrome, whichever one's your favorite browser. And then when you log on to the website and you go to the Salvation page, the video will come up and you'll be able to see it. And uh, that video is... Uh, uh, is, 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 uh, it'll stir you. It'll stir you. It'll move you. It'll get your attention. Uh, when you go to the line of Judah and go to the front page, in other words, when you pull up the web page, you'll see right in the center of it. How many have seen what I've got posted in the center of the web page? Well, I've got a murdering Muslim with his arm around a little girl. That little girl's crying because he's getting ready to cut her head off. It's about that big. He's getting ready to behead her. But he has the most demonic smile on his face. He's a demon-possessed murderer. Uh, 35,000 people are on top of Mount Sinjar right now. Yazidis and Christians and what have you fleeing from these murderers and uh, rightfully so because they're crucifying them I've, I've had to do some praying and I'm, I have to get some direction from God as to what to post because some of these things are graphic I don't know if you've ever seen a real crucifixion or not but there are some real crucifixions of Christians on the internet Real Christians that have been crucified at the hands of these murdering Muslims. And you say, well, no, we need to pray for them. Yes, we do, but you better lock and load. Because, you see, you live in America. We've got an ocean between us and them. And most people are relatively safe in this country, except those in New York City in September the 11th, 2001. They weren't safe. Over 3,000 of them died at the hands of murdering Muslims. And all of these generals, I'm listening to the generals now. Forget the politician. Listen to that professional military man, the general. He'll tell you that we are in jeopardy. He'll tell you that this country is being invaded right now through the southern border by Muslims, by radical Muslims, and they intend to come in here and kill you. They're going to kill you. I've been on their website. I spent about 20 minutes, 25 minutes yesterday listening to one of, their, uh, one of their preachers and all of them sitting around. I couldn't understand a thing he said. I couldn't understand a thing that was said, but I could get their spirit, and I watched them. And these people, are, these people have a spirit attached to them. They're going to kill you. They are going to kill you, and they're going to shout Allahu Akbar when they do it. They're going to embrace and kiss each other, and they're certain they're in the will of God 
and they're going to take your wives and they're going to rape them. They're going to take your children and they're going to behead them. And they're going to take you and nail you on a cross. They're going to crucify you. If they can get to you, that's what they're going to do. Now, what you have to do is consider, you, is consider well, now, what do I do? Well, what you do is pray. What you do is live a Christian life. What you do is witness for the Lord. What you do is to try to support your government and pray for your government and pray for the people of America. This is my homeland. I was born and raised here. But if it comes down to it and they start coming after you, kill them. If they come to your house to drag your wife out in the street and your children, kill them. That's what you do. You take care of your family. Now all it takes is a little history. Just a little, not much, but a little history. To go back and think about the gates of Vienna or the battle of, of uh, Tours, Charles Martel, and a few other battles that were fought in Europe during the time right after the Crusades, 14-1500, when the Muslim hordes were literally invading Europe. They were coming in in Europe. They weren't going to come in, and they were going to do then exactly what they're doing now. I heard a three-star general and a lieutenant colonel say yesterday that in their lifetime, in their lifetime, they have never seen such barbarity that they're seeing now. They have never witnessed the kind of killing that they're seeing right now. They've never seen anything like that. We're talking about men that have been on the battlefield. They're talking about how barbaric these people are. They are religious fanatics. They'll kill you. Now, uh, when I tell you that tonight, I'm sure you understand you're a law-abiding citizen, aren't you? Certainly you're a law-abiding citizen. We don't live, this is not a wild west. This is not anarchy. But if these people for example, over there in Syria and over there in Iraq, there are, there's no police over there. There's nobody. There's no police force to stop them. There's no police to stop them. They have, an, they have, an, they have a terrorist army that is 10,000 strong, folks. 10,000. A terrorist army. And most Americans are asleep. They're asleep. They're asleep. And they don't realize what's going on over there. And now, finally, the president has sent some military assistance to the Kurds. The Kurds are probably the best hope right now of slowing these people down. And the Kurds are not Muslims. They're a separate unit. For years, they've tried to have their own country. But they're trying to slow them down, the Kurds. And the Kurds are helping with these people that are on top of Mount Sinjar. So they're, they're, the, they're a friend. They're trying to help. But there's no... There's no law. The law is a gun barrel. That's the law. And if it ever gets to that point, Christian, if it ever gets to the point, and that's the way it did in Europe, men had to go out on horseback with swords and cut the Muslim down, or he would have come into Europe and overrun Europe and drugged their women into the streets and their children, and they had to stop them. Now, folks, that is a fact of history. And you might not appreciate the fact that a lot of them were Catholics. You know, you get into a lot of stuff like that. But it's still history. That's what happened. The freedoms that we enjoy in America tonight are not cheap. I mean, we've, we've shed some blood for these freedoms, haven't we? And who is it that said the price of freedom is eternal vigilance? It has a price attached to it. You can't go to sleep. You've got to stay awake. And you've got to watch what's happening. And so the president, to his credit, thank God, a little late, but thank God, has sent some military help over there, trying to do something to stop these murderers. Because I think even he realizes they'll show no mercy. And it's not going to look good for any president's watch if 40,000 people are butchered on top of a mountain. That's not going to look good on any president's watch. And so, you know, and uh, for whatever the motive, I'm glad that he's doing what he is. I was told a few minutes ago they've sent the Marines in now and that uh, some special forces. 
and uh, uh, the Rangers and whatever else, you know, they sent a man good. Thank God for that. Good. Good for them. These men are well trained and they know what they're doing. And, uh, but all of that still, it comes down to us in this country. They say that they're going to raise the flag of Allah in the White House. They've already told us that. They've already showed you what they'll do. They'll crucify you. They'll take a little girl and put their arm around her and behead her. Now, where are these people going? They're going to hell. They think they've got 70 virgins up there waiting for them. They've got hell, fire, and damnation waiting for them. They're demon-possessed murderers. Now, I know it's not politically correct. I understand that. I realize all the implications of it. But I think most of the American people are beginning to wake up, and they're not fools. I do. I believe they realize there's a political movement behind everything and that they've, there's a reason for all this political correct talk you're getting, but the people have got better sense than that. They know what's going on. They realize that. And so he said that he's going to turn them into hell. The word Gehenna in the New Testament comes from the Valley of Henna. There's three words in the New Testament that are important as it relates to hell. Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus. The Apostle Peter talks about Tartarus, and here's what he says. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment. The Apostle Peter said that, and he used the word Tartarus. He didn't create coin a, coin a phrase. It's well known. What is Tartarus? Tartarus is the lowest hell. It's the lowest hell. Gehenna is a reference to hell itself. Hades is a reference to the unseen state of the dead, whether they're burning in hell or whether they're in Abraham's bosom. See what I mean? Hades and Sheol refer to the same place. And so don't ever, ever let anybody come along and say to you, well, Sheol simply means the grave. And it has been translated grave in the Old Testament and, 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 and grave in the, in, the, in the grave in the abstract sense, grave, grave in, the, in the symbolical sense. Kibor is the Hebrew word for a hole in the ground. So if the Hebrew wants to say, we put them in a hole in the ground, they use Kibor. But if they use Sheol, they're saying the grave, yes, but the grave is much bigger than a hole in the ground. It has to do with the unseen state of the dead. So don't ever let anybody flim-flam you and try to tell you that Sheol is only referring to the grave or that Hades is only a reference to the grave. It's not. It means the unseen state of the dead. The dead lost are in hell fire. The dead saved are in, the, in Abraham's bosom. But how many of you know your Bible? How many of you know what happened to Abraham's bosom? You know what happened, don't you? It's not there anymore, is it? No. He said he led captivity captive, gave gifts to man. The Lord Jesus emptied it and carried them on up to glory, announced the victory, and they went with him. They couldn't enter into heaven until he entered into heaven. There was no atonement made. There was no New Testament till the blood of Christ was shed. He was absolutely essential for him to be the first one. He's the archegos. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the leader. He's the one who enters first. Then all of us go in behind him. He's the first fruits of the resurrection, the first fruits of them that slept. The Lord Jesus is all of these things. And so, you know, that gets off into another part of, of, of studying the New Testament. But you, you all that study the Bible, you know that. So you understand that. So the New Testament uses three words translated as hell. Hades, unseen state of the dead. Gehenna, that's the pit, that's hell, hell fire. That's not the unseen state of the dead. Anytime the word Gehenna shows up in the New Testament, that's what it's talking about. But it's a reference, but it, it but it points to the Valley of Hinnom, which is a picture of what's going on. The Valley of Hinnom was the Valley of Tophet in the Old Testament, the place where they offered human sacrifice, put their babies in the arms of Molech, and listened to them scream as they rolled off into that iron belly and burned in the flames. And the perpetual burning of the trash heap and the fire and the stench and the maggots and everything associated with it was to all who looked upon it a place of torment, and that's what hell looks like. But that's not hell. See, it's only symbolical of it. So uh, you have Hades, Gehenna, or Hinnom, or, or Gehenna, 
and Tartarus. These are the three words translated to hell in the New Testament. So, you know, when you look at it, you, you say to yourself, well, there's a lot in there about that, isn't there? Yes, there is. You know why? God doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to go to hell. I think we belittle and take away from that horrible sacrifice that our Lord made at the cross if we don't understand that the unsaved soul goes to hell. He endured horrible torment to keep you out of the pit, keep you from hell. So it's a serious thing, isn't it? Let me look at some considerations tonight, since I've said all of this, then we'll come to a close. Number one, I'm not going to hell. Amen. Hallelujah to God. And that's not an arrogant statement. That's when I get on my face and I say, Lord Jesus, you're my hope, my help, my Savior, my Lord. You're the only way I can stay out of hell. I don't trust. I could preach for a thousand years. That wouldn't get me out of hell. Do all the good deeds a man could possibly do. Be the best a man could possibly be. Give every dime I've got and give my blood and let myself be nailed on a cross. That still wouldn't keep me out of hell. But Christ Jesus the Lord keep you out of hell. I'm not going to hell. Thank God. Thank God. You say, how do you know that they're not? How do you know that you're not wrong and they're right? Look at them. Do you live up here in the Northeast? Yale, Harvard, Brown, Princeton? Is that where you're from? You spend your life, your head buried in the sand. You're one of those Eastern liberals. Uh, you don't know whether you're up or down, coming or going. You don't have enough sense to get in out of the rain. Don't know a thing about life, sin, death, hell, and the devil. As ignorant as you can be. I've listened to these liberals for 67 years. They're stupid. They're just plain stupid. Why do you think people do what they do? They do it because of sin. They do it because they're fallen creatures. Somebody said, well, you know, there's no difference between Israel killing those babies in Palestine or the, the, the Palestinian children. Uh, when they when they send their, when they make an airstrike with their with their jets or their artillery, there's no difference in that and what these uh, these uh, uh, freedom fighters or, or these insurgents they like the word insurgent, uh, what these insurgents are doing over there in in Syria and Iraq. Oh, they're in. There's a vast difference between what they're doing. They're not targeting babies. They've had plenty of their babies die. How many of you know who Hamas is? Do you know what Hamas has done there? In, in, uh, did you know? I read a thing the other day about Hamas. You know, they found all these tunnels. They found all these tunnels. Do you know how those tunnels were dug? They hired the farmers, you know, the men with callus. Most terrorists don't have callus on their hands. The men with calluses that work in the field, they hired them. Where they hired them? The money that came from Qatar. Saudi Arabia, these oil-rich countries, they funnel that money straight into the terrorist, into Hamas. Here's what they did. They hired these illiterate farmers to dig these tunnels. And in, you know what they did? They did what the ancient Egyptian pharaoh did when they dug the tomb of the pharaoh. What did they do then? They killed them. So nobody would know where it was. Say, so how do you know that, preacher? It comes on the testimony of a number of people who were there, and they watched what they did. They would kill them. They would blindfold them, take them to the work site. They would dig for 10, 12 hours a day, and they told you, I forget how far they would gain in a day's time, maybe something like four or five feet they would go in a full day's work, digging these tunnels. And then when, the, and when they were finished, they'd blindfold them, take them back, and then when they were finished with the tunnel, they would execute them so that they couldn't tell anybody uh, where it was and they could keep their tunnel <coughs> secret so they could come through the tunnel and come out on the other side and kill women and children. You know that's what they do, don't you? They don't go after military targets. They go after people. It's not about military. It's about people. But in any event, 
I thank God I'm not going to hell. But number two, uh, it's wake up. It's wake up time. It's about over. It's about over. Yeah, it is. It's about over. As Lieutenant General said yesterday, he said, World War, uh, uh, Iraq War Number Three started. And with that World War Three, it's about over. Yeah. I wish we had one of those generals in the White House. Especially one of them had a lot of combat experience and, and some, uh, uh, you know, dealing with nations and, and heads of nations and so forth. Uh, if you'll know that MacArthur, if they had listened to uh, Douglas MacArthur at the, at, at the, at, uh, when that Korean conflict started, if they'd listened to him, they would have taken China and they would have stopped a lot of the mess that's on over there right now. You wouldn't have had North Vietnam. You wouldn't have had any 50-something thousand men die in North Vietnam. The only reason North Vietnam had any strength at all was because of the Chinese who sent thousands across the border to help them. All of that would have been stopped, but they wouldn't. Truman would not let that military man do what he wanted to do. He wanted to do it, and he would have. MacArthur, MacArthur was a military genius. When he landed those troops at Inchon, the tide at Inchon is something like 30 feet. Can you imagine a tide 30 feet high? Can you imagine going out to the water's edge, and here it is, and then go back at high tide, and it's 30 feet higher? And so if you're trying to land troops on the beach, and you've got you've got a tide shift of 30 feet. If you get in there, at, you get in there at low tide, or get in there at high tide, you're going to get in trouble. You have to get that thing just exactly right. And they told him and said, "You're you're going to risk uh, you're going to risk tens of thousands of troops." He said, "Yes, but I can cut them off if I do it." And it worked. He landed his troops, and when he did, he came in behind the North Korean army and cut them off on the southern peninsula. Cut them off. But they don't listen to the military men. And the one in there now won't do that either. And then number three, are you witnessing? Are you telling people about the Lord? Are you trying to get them saved? How do you do that? Let me give you three things. Your life, number one. If they don't know you, okay, that's one thing. But if they know you, don't be like Lot when he tried to witness to his sons-in-laws about judgment coming. They thought he was mocking in other words, you've never preached to us before. Why you decide to preach now? You know, we know who you are. You sit in the gate here at Sodom. And now here you are. You're going to witness. You're going to tell us that fire's coming on this place? Nah, no big deal there. Mr. Lot, forget about it. But it did come. They thought he was one that mocked. And so uh, witness. Your life is a witness, folks. Your life is a witness. And then tracks. The Word of God in these tracks. God uses tracks. We got a bunch of tracks about there in the foyer. I think we can get, so I'd like to get Jack Chick's track in here on This Is Your Life. That is an outstanding track. God has used that track to, uh, as I told you a moment ago, he saved four people uh, over the Internet from, from reading the track. They read those tracks, and uh, you can give them out. And then prayer. Don't ever be presumptuous to think that you have the ability to do anything. You can't. Without him, we can do nothing. We can't even witness without him. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. I'd like to see the power of God on Temple Baptist Church, but he's not going to give you the power of God to make you feel good. It's not going to work that way. You're going to have to be, you're going to have to be serious. You've got to be serious about praying and reading your Bible and witnessing. We've got a generation of kids growing up today. These kids today are in the lurch. They're between. They're being pulled both ways. All right? School started back now. <coughs> school just started back. I don't get excited about school. I don't get a bit excited about it. Not one bit. I saw on the, on the television yesterday where a man, he won the lottery. He had $115 million. He, he won $115 million somewhere in there. He gave $50,000 to, uh, uh, to uh, Second Harvest. And I found out, and I didn't know this, but I found out that Second Harvest gives children, they give little children food in their, uh, in, a, in a backpack or something to take home with them. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That's a good thing. Folks, that's a good thing. 
But the reason I say that is he gave them $50,000. That's buying a lot of food. Uh, if I had $115 million, there'd be another school in Knoxville. As quick as I could get it built. You better believe it. From, from K-1 all the way through grade 13, <laughs> we'd cover everything. <laughs> sure would. There would be. There'd be a school here. And uh, if I could possibly do it, and with, if you had that kind of money, uh, free tuition. You know, a lot, of these, a lot of people like to put their kids in a Christian school, and they can't afford it. It's expensive. And I'm not trying to be critical tonight. I know it costs money to run a school. It's expensive. I know that. But uh, if I had $115 million, I wouldn't stop any child from coming. They'd be in that schoolhouse. They would be. And I'd put the best teachers I could find in those classrooms. And I'd be teaching those kids. They would be, they would, I would do everything I could possibly do to counter the garbage that they're going to get out of the public school system when they get loaded up with humanism, evolution, and all the rest of the junk that goes with it. I'd give it to them. Would you all pray about that tonight? <laughs> pray that God will drop us $115 million out. We'd start us up a committee and say, all right, boys, let's sit down here. Let's get this thing going now. Find us a place and build us a school. And, uh, and what's that? Make a motion. Make a motion. I second it. Amen. How many in favor show your right, your right hand? All right. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Father, I thank you, Lord. I ask you to bless your word tonight. Bless my brothers and my sisters. Bless Temple Baptist Church, Father. You've got to work for us. You've got a reason for us being here. And God, show us. Grant us and give us wisdom. And Heavenly Father, help us here. We pray in Jesus' name. Show us the ministry and the work that you'd have us do, the places you'd have us go, the doors you'd open for us. God, I pray that you touch brothers and sisters here. Touch them and move their hearts, their soul. Give them a vision, Heavenly Father, if need be, of the things that need to be done. And then show us how to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, folks.